of the coronavirus pandemic, our light teams around the world have continued their important and we wanted to give them the opportunity to share what they've been up to over the last six months and to give a lights community of supporters like you all the chance to connect and to learn more. Now, a few housekeeping items. Uh, please mute yourselves um, so we'll be able to hear our speakers. Um, but we will have a Q&A time at the end. But as I mentioned, this is casual and interactive. So please feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll answer them in real time as well. Now, I also have a lot of my elite colleagues here on the call from all around the world, from Minneapolis to Somalia. And uh, they will be answering their questions. They will be answering um, questions in the chat as well, including many of the colleagues from our Global Connector team as well. So please ask away in the chat as we go. We also have a, special, a few special guests on the call today. And I think we've already seen them in chat. Many people have actually had the opportunity to travel to Rwanda and we're part of making this school happen. So welcome. Uh, we're really glad you're here and we look, we're glad you're here and we look forward to hearing from you. So today's work share is going to shine a spotlight on the incredible work that brought coding schools to refugee camp residents and host community members. The first cohort actually kicked off in October of 2019 in the Gehembe and Navaheke refugee camps. We're gonna hear the story about how this program has not only trained students on coding skills, but it's provided them with the mentorship and training in smart skills. Students are tasked with using logic to solve community challenges. And in addition to technical skills, Coding by itself has actually been found to be a tool to help them develop critical thinking, problem solving, and communication skill sets. This all adds up to setting more students up for future success and new opportunities. And we're really lucky to have us with us today two amazing people at the center of this work. Alight's own Jacques Rumenica and Aphrodis Mutangana. Jacques is, the creative, is a creative and partnership activator with Alight in Rwanda. He works to build new partnerships with the private sector and connect people to Alight's work across East Africa. As you'll hear today, he's really passionate about humanitarian interventions, development challenges, development changes around the world, and making new connections and friends. Aphrodis, at his core, I like to describe him as a social entrepreneur and a tech enthusiast. He's launched multiple businesses, including Foyo, which is a mobile pharmaceutical directory. And he was the managing director of K-Lab, which is an open space hub for IT entrepreneurs to collaborate, innovate in Kigali. And you'll hear a lot more about that in just a bit. But part of what makes this story so fascinating and what makes this partnership so successful is that Jacques and Aphrodis didn't just stumble upon a good idea together, they actually know each other from their past lives. So as Jacques and Aphrodis come on to video and you'll see, we're gonna hear, um, we're gonna hear more about like how they did this and what they did in just a bit. Um, and we're gonna get inside this coding schools as well and then have a deep dive conversations about what the coding schools actually look like. But to start, I actually wanna get into the, how the story actually started. So Jacques and Aphrodis, you're going to get a sick. We're going to go through a couple of get to know your questions. But the first one actually goes to both of you. I want you to take us to the beginning. Can you tell us how, when, and where the two of you met? Um, uh, should I? I don't know. Should I let Aphrodis? Do you, you want to go first? No, go, go fast. Go fast. <laughs> All right. All right. So, hello, everybody. Um, it's so exciting. I, I didn't expect it to be like this. You know, like the, my screen is full of faces that I know, the people I worked with, and uh, then I feel a lot of excitement and I'll be turning like chocolate in a minute. So bear with me now. So my name is Jack, and I've been with the, with the light for the past six years. And um, it has been a journey full of uh, amazing discovery, um, which uh, brought me to call myself a wanderer and a lucky, a very lucky guy. Um, okay. So I, Aphrodis, I met Aphrodis long ago, I can say since two, 2000 and what, 2004 or five, something like that, and six, right? 
Yeah. So we were at the faculty, we were all doing um, what we are not doing now. So basically, we were studying and I was doing my engineering in soil science and environment management. And after this, what were you doing again? In, in the the has pro uh, crop production and horticulture. Can you imagine? I thought he should be growing plants right now. I don't know what he's doing. So <laughs> even myself, I should be designing how uh, agriculture people should be uh, taking care of the soil to protect the environment and do responsible agriculture. So that's when we met uh, together, but we were both involved in different other um, project outside of the faculty. Like myself, I was more engaged into public health project, which um, brought us and my colleagues from the Faculty of Medicine to start a student-based NGO um, uh, that we left behind as we left the faculty. But until now, it's still existing and working and teaching other fellow Rwandans to become responsible citizens and travel around the world. That's what made me travel around the world. And after this, I'm sure after not doing horticulture, he landed in tech. I think he can tell us more how we end up with that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Alfredis, yeah, do you have how tell us the tell us your side of the story about how, when, and where you and John first met? So uh, <laughs> as Jack said, we, we, we met at the university, you know. We met at the university and uh, we were doing both agriculture and uh, but uh, we have to say we have something in common, you know, we are all adventurers. I don't know if that word exists in English. You know, we like yeah. to, to, you know, to do ad adventures, you know. And uh, yeah, this is how we met Jack. And uh, he was in v VSO, the, the organization they founded. And uh, I was in other groups. And uh, by the way, I started my first business when I was at the university in the second year and it failed. And uh, I never mentioned that. And uh, did it happen? No, I don't know. <laughs> it's sleeping somewhere. But uh, yeah. Uh, it's where we met Jack and um, we became friends and uh, we, we, then after a few years we met when he was at ARC for my ARC, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So I, I'm curious, where, you mentioned you started your first business when you were in college, where did that real passion come from and how do you make it grow? <clears throat> so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long story. But uh, it's uh, it's it's really also it's a long story, but also emotional story. And when I was in a, in a, uh, in senior when I was like seventeen, uh, I felt sick. I felt sick, but not really like uh, a serious like serious uh, um, uh, disease or something. It was like flu. But I'm one of the people who are afraid of hospitals. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, I took emotional decision. I said, every Friday, I will be visiting sick people. Every Friday. I did it like three times and I stopped. And um, when I finished secondary school, I wanted to go to study in France. And uh, every university I applied to, they said no. So, and uh, the whole year I was applying, 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 and they, they were saying no. And uh, <laughs> then I, I went to, to the University of Rwanda in, 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 where I, I met Jack. And uh, I wanted to do med uh, faculty of medicine. You know, I wanted to be a medical doctor. And uh, when I applied, they said, no, you don't have enough maths. I tried pharmacy, they said, you don't, you don't have enough maths. Then I went to agriculture. I think I went to agriculture to look for friends. Huh? <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, so this is this is then in, uh, I started that one, and every initiative, everything I've been doing is really connected. It's there is a, a reason behind, and uh, many times it's an unofficial reasons, personal reasons. <laughs> I will tell you more about that after that. <laughs> yeah, we will hear more. So I'm curious. So COVID obviously has been really tough on so many people around the world. But is there something positive that has come out of the last six months for you that you can tell us about? So I go first, Jack. Yes. Yeah. 
You mean me? I start. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Alfred. Yeah. There, 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 there are a lot. There are a lot. There are a lot. Very a, a lot. Let me. How? What can I share? Like a lot. But let me share like uh, two or three things. <clears throat> the first thing, the the, the the positive thing, is that when you are in in situation like that, you know, your 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 brain works. I remember like a. Uh, for example, one of the things I'm happy that I contributed to is that um, there is an application when COVID started in Rwanda, there is an application I made and it's being used, it has been used, it has been used in Rwanda and more than 2 million people have used it. So it's a USSD, you know, when you call, you know, there is a hotline, we have 114, once you think that you have um, a symptom or, you know, to call. Then I said, if 1000 people call at the same time what will happen. And uh, I said, let me create a USSD platform where I, I asked the same question, but using the USSD. When I say USSD, it's for people who don't have smartphones, where you dial like star 114 hash. Then I ask all the questions they will ask if you call and the application can receive at the same time more than 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 at the same time. And it has been used in the country and it contributed to, 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 you know, to help many. And, um, and by the way, after with, once the COVID is over, the data can help to predict the future of healthcare in Rwanda. Uh, then uh, uh, I managed to learn how to, 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 like there are many positive things I learned during COVID. You know, that's amazing. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jacques, over to you. I'm curious. So you embody so many of the Alight values, but there's two that I think resonate so much with many people, which are choosing optimism and sparking joy. <laughs> Where does your positive outlook on life come from? And how do you keep that going even through times of COVID? Yeah, um, I think... Uh, deep inside, even before COVID, um, uh, yeah, um, I think there are different. I can I can find answers in different areas of my life. Um, one is uh, when you're a child and you realize as soon as you are like seven, eight, that you no longer have your siblings and people to be your true friends from your own bloodline. You create your own friends. You create your own toys because you are so lonely. And that pushed me also and opened me to, to give other people a place in my heart. So which happened to me after the genocide, I found myself alone. Yet by going to boarding school, attending universities, I learned to open my heart to other people so that they can have a place inside. And that's how you create friends. So, and there's, when you, are, you wanna create friends, I think a smile is the first thing you need to share with someone and a hello for a known person and everything starts from there. So I think um, I, I tested myself by going one time to Germany and to live in a deep village of Bavaria where they even speak, my English is bad, but they speak worse. It's even worse. You know, even myself, I struggle to understand what they try to, to say, but spending there and making friends without even being able to talk to each other, that mean, it means you need a little to make friends. So, and then coming to a light, I worked for so many organizations before, uh, small and big. So I, I, I would say that a light is the one that um, um, gave me an opportunity to connect with more people on an emotional level, not on material level. So when I say big organization, think about something as big as the Clinton Foundations, you know, and sitting in an office in, uh, on Rockefeller Center in, in New York, Midtown, right? So that's huge, but there's no connection between the people. And I felt so detached to the people I really want to help. So which is a platform actually Alight gave me like six years back. So that's where I dig my energy. That's where it comes from. Thank you. That's amazing. So Jacques, so uh, Daddy Zhang in the chat actually mentioned uh, that you got married. So congratulations in order. <laughs> but I'm curious, is there something, so you got married during a global health pandemic. And is yeah. there something that you 
married during this pandemic that actually that you've learned that you don't think you would have learned otherwise? Uh, one thing all the Rwandans will uh, um, will will have will know how to do is to have a wedding in a Western style. Only thirty people to attend, including you and your wife at the bride. <laughs> so that's, that's something we learned the hard way. So, however, it's, uh, it was challenging. I'm, I'm happier now. Uh, I met the person that um, you feel like is the one and there's nobody else. And, uh, and you, you, you feel like you can throw yourself in there without any fear. So th that's, that's a different feeling. You know, I used to calculate every move I make when I travel, when I meet people. But now I think it's different. You know, I, I no longer do that. You know, I'm a very vulnerable person. And I think to love is to accept being vulnerable. <laughs> and uh, I will say also that uh, doing my wedding during COVID where I had to pay close to $2,000 to have people tested to come to the event, especially those who cannot afford the test. The test is $50 to $6. So I had in my family people who could not afford that. So I had to do that for them so that they have to be there because they're important. But so many friends contributed and gave also money and they tested themselves to come to the wedding. You realize how big is the family, no matter how small is the number. So I was blessed to have a very small wedding. That's great. But that's COVID that's also, amazing. Yeah, and, and, and COVID taught Rwandans how to be mindful about the budget. Nowadays, I don't know if people will keep doing wedding of 800 or me, I was projecting 750. So that one was not gonna happen. We had 70. Thank you. That's awesome. So small in numbers, big in love. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, you're each gonna get the last get to know you questions, the same one. So Jacques, we'll stick with you. You can answer it first and then we'll go to Aphrodis. So can you each describe um, if you can in 30 seconds or less, one thing about yourselves that you would think would be the most surprising to any of us on the call. So someone who's never met you or someone who knows you really well, what's the one thing that you think would be most surprising to all of us? Doc? Wow. Uh, somebody warned me that if it's Jeremy asking the question, I say yes. They say, all right, you better be prepared. So I think this is your <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so one thing that people don't know, I, I did agriculture, I worked in health, I did all that, but I consider myself as a wanderer. And one way to bring people around yourself when you're wandering around the world is to be a, big, a good chef. So when I retire, I need to create a responsible gourmet club. So where all of you will be traveling to Rwanda and then you'll be stay, staying in my mansion. So I'll be the chef and, because I love cooking. That's amazing. Aphrodis? That, that question is so difficult. You know, I was, I, I was trying to think how, you know, how I responded. Uh, but um, one of the things people, <laughs> they don't know, always I have a hidden agenda, like, but a positive one. Like everything I do, I have a hidden agenda. And I will tell you, uh, I will tell you when I will be sharing my testimony, how everything I do, there is a hidden agenda, but uh, I always find a way of covering it. Yeah, you know. That's great, that's great. <laughs> so we're gonna continue our conversation with Jacques and Aphrodis and take a deep dive into the coding school. What we wanna do first is we're gonna show you a video because we want <laughs> people to take you inside the school just for about two and a half minutes and then we'll pick back up our conversation. Um, and so please feel free to keep throwing questions in the chat, but we're gonna take you inside the school right now. Being a refugee is one of the harshest conditions a human being can endure. Life in the camps does not have that much to offer. Mostly the lack of material comforts is accompanied by lack of sustainable income generating opportunities. The School of Coding for Refugees has been started with the aim of availing opportunities for some young refugees. <laughs> 
user interface user interface ni bino tubona none hakaza nicyo bita back end back end ni ni bya bintu noneho twe twandika ariko bitagaragaraza namaso ni gute ubwo ibintu turi kubona hano twanditse hano turi yatubona na hariya bivuze ngo byivuze eh nawe ushaka kugira bibona nabyo nabigufasha there students from two camps Jihembe and Nyabiheche have been enrolled in the program. They will undergo a six month training in coding. They will be introduced to different coding languages, and the goal is to enable them by equipping them with skills in web, desktop, and mobile application development. At the end of the training, each of the students will earn an international certification in coding, while a paid internship and job placement will be availed to the best performers. <laughs> ndabona kandi ko tuzakomeza tugenda twiga tuzagenda tumenya byinshi bitewe n'uko ndi ko nabantu batuzaniye bafite ingufu mu byo bari gukora icyo mbona nababwira no kubashimira ko bera yuko bagutekerejeho cyane cyane n'inkunzi ndetse na community yahanze kobera ko bino bintu ari byiza cyane amasomo tuzakuramo azadufasha mu muzima bwacu bwa buri munsi the ICT and coding school in Gihembe and Nyabiheke is an initiative of Alight, formerly ARC, in partnership with KLab. It was funded by UNHCR, Alight Change Makers, with the support of the Rwandan government through the Ministry of Emergency Management and MTN. That's great. It's so inspirational. So. I, one thing I want to, so Jacques and Averdis, we're going to pick back up our conversation. And I think one thing that I think to frame the context is this. So I think a lot of people don't always realize that Kigali is actually a tech, IT, and business hub in Africa. You know, and in fact, we've even seen that in the last six months, where Rwanda was one of the only countries in sub-Saharan Africa to use technology in its COVID-19 response, using drones and other methods uh, to monitor and educate citizens. And this question is actually for both of you. I'm wondering, can you tell us what is it about the people and the culture in Rwanda that makes it such a vibrant place for tech and startups? Jacques, over to you. Oh, you're on mute, Jacques. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, it's yeah. life of Zoom in the age of COVID. It's all good. <laughs> I know. Uh, right. So, first of all, when you look at Rwanda as a country, you have to realize a few things. <clears throat> One is our community, the Rwandan society is too, is very young. It's very young. And uh, tech is something youth embraces very quickly. You know, like now my younger brother and sisters who were born after 1996, they are the one teaching me a few things about my phone that I actually don't know. So, and... I, I'm still on Facebook. They no longer use Facebook. They're on Snap, Snap something like Snapchat. I, I don't know that thing. So, um, so you 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 can tell Rwanda is a good um, nursery for to 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 cultivate these kind of new technologies and so forth. Plus, it's a it's a landlocked country. When you see that, then you need to create a platform where people feel their mind are unlocked. You know. So if you can work remotely using technology, then you better do it because you are not, you don't, you're not connected to any ocean to export easily, to transact easily with the world. So for me, I, I think that's why we are open to this kind of and became a hub. Plus the government will of pushing this technology, I think uh, among the three highest people who are pushing for technology in the world, including a business person from Mexico, so Kagame, the president of Rwanda, is actually uh, 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 a chairperson on that committee to how to unlock potentials of Africa using technology. So we cannot preach it to other people when even in our country, we are not even doing that. So nowadays, I realize that people told me that I cannot get contribution for my wedding if I don't have an account of, on what we call Momo, mobile money uh, account. So I'm transacting like 76% of my transactions via my phone and less via my bank and a card. So that tells you, those are indicators telling you how much actually Rwanda has become quickly a hub for technology. 
Uh, Aphrodis, can you add more? Just, just to add what Jack was saying, uh, the, the reason why you can see that Rwanda is known on a, on a, on a continent or on international level, it's because you know to have a, a strong ecosystem, you have to have many players. So many players, um, I mean, uh, you, you, you must have the government putting in place the policies, you, you must have the private sector playing its role. You have to have investors who are investing. You have to have academia, you know, producing the talent. Once all of them, they come together, you know, you have a strong ecosystem. So, and uh, this is the reason why, again, there is another factor that the country is so young. You know, I don't know if you know the statistics, but 2% uh, of Rwandans, 2% um, of Rwandans are above 50 years old. 78 under 35, 70 under 30, 50 under 20, for 3% under 16. So to tell you how young the country is, you know, so and uh, the, it's easier, as Jack said, for, for young people to, 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 to embrace technology. Not only that, because it's something you can start a business with a small amount of investment. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting to hear you both talk about the youth component, and coupled with the government support, I think is is also really interesting. So, Jacques, I want you to take us to the beginning of the project. I mean, obviously, you have spent a lot of time working in refugee camps um, around Rwanda, and as you know, and many of us know, a computer lab, let alone a coding school, is not something that you would actually find in most refugee camps. Can you take us to the beginning? Where did the idea come from? And how did this, what was the genesis of this idea? Right. Um, that, that's a very interesting question because uh, it brings back a lot of memory for me. Uh, and thank you for the picture that we have there. And it tells everything. So we, we some of us may know, but those who are new on this platform, um, a light at global level, at Minneapolis level, we organize what we call change makers trips where people from around the world, mainly United States, uh, different states in the US, they come down, they work with us on a specific project in the camp. So as some of them came to work on a different, completely different project, so we get time to conclude the trip and we sit together with youth in the camp just to interact and exchange. So I remember one person asking them, hey guys, when you guys don't have anything to do and you, you Basically, you don't have a job, you're not at school, so what do you do? So it, one young guy stood and said, hey, we don't, we don't do anything, we don't have anything to do. So what would you really feel like you want to do? And then the person said, hey, this camp, we feel like we are locked not only at physical level, but at a mind level. We feel like by having a small internet cafe uh, or access to a connected computer, it will unlock us, we'll communicate with our fellow uh, colleagues and family members <coughs> resettled in the United States, and that will be very helpful. So we didn't have much to do it at that time. And basically they went back to the US with that in mind, and they, were, they sat together to say, hey, what are we gonna do for these young people? So they fundraised some money and when it was sent to us, I said, okay, this is little, but yet we can do something about, with this money. So we had to take a house that was a carpentry and basically transform it into a coding, basically a, 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 a room with 16 seaters and computers and internet connection. So, and then as we were launching that little room you see there, um, I invite, I say, let's invite people in the public sectors who can get inspired about this, who can help us to push this agenda forward. That's how I invited Caleb, and that's how Aphrodis comes in to launch a small internet hub. But when we get there, Aphrodis saw beyond the internet hub and say, hey, we can teach this guy and give them opportunity to gain jobs in high paid jobs here in Rwanda by teaching them how to code. I was skeptic because myself, knowing the elementary like computer use, how are we gonna teach this book from ground zero to A plus quarters level to be able to get to take them to telco companies and other people may need their service. So um, that's how everything started. And then uh, after this and now we start to think how to do it. And then UNHCR joined us 
uh, by providing some means, and they ask us to extend the coding school to another camp. So that's how, from Nyabiheke, one small small lab, we grew into two coding schools across two camps, basically covering almost 30,000 people, 15,000 per camp. And we we recruited our first cohort together with Aphrodis. Um, we had to put in kids from 18 years and above, those who have done at least some secondary school, some secondary education. And then that's how everything started. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I think, you know, is a lot of folks on this know, you know, Alight is an organization that's built around the voice of our customer. And I think one thing that I didn't know is that you all were just literally in the camps talking to people and getting their ideas. And it's interesting that it first started as an internet hub was the original concept. In Jacques, you know, this is where it's in. And the original idea that was voice that, you know, was that came from the voice of the customer was an internet hub. So Jacques, you came in, you saw this, but then is uh, our Aphrodis, you came in and Jacques, as Jacques was mentioning when you came in, it obviously turned into something new and something different and something bigger. Can you tell us when you first started talking to Jacques and Alight about this, what did you see and how did your vision change? Huh. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so let me, as, as I said, when I was introducing myself, I said that uh, 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 I have a hidden, hidden agenda. The hidden agenda understand an official reason, you know, an official reason. An official reason, I like, one of my story, when I was 10, 11, I went to study in Northern province of Rwanda, in rural area, like, uh, uh, you know, in rural area, and and uh, I was always the second in my class. There is one kid, he was he was always the first. I tried all my best to be that kid. You know, the kids of 10, 11, everyone wants to be the, the, the first. I tried all my best, and that kid was always the first. And I was always the second. When we finished primary school, that kid didn't get the chance to continue. He dropped out due to financial means. You know, I said, you know, we have many kids who we drop out, not because they are dumb, but because they are poor. And, um, and uh, then this is the reason why, why I was connected with introducing kids and young people at early age. Then, then uh, in 2016, I went to Jordan. I went to Jordan, to Zatari camp, to teach refugees in Zatari camp how to code. And it's the first time I heard that um, the refugees, wherever they are, I didn't know this, that, that they are called a lost generation. But I said, you know, if, if they are not really lost as lost, because if you give the opportunities others are getting, you know, they can do something. So this is how I was connected with the refugees, first of all. And um, when I saw the, the, the computer lab, uh, it, it just, like uh, my mind went back to that come to say, you know, this is a lost generation. No, let, let, let's help them to, 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 to equip them with the skills needed on the market. Then if, see if we can place them, if there will be a lost generation, as people say. So this is how I, 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 I embark to that journey to say, this is, let's prove them wrong that refugees are people like others, they can do if you equip them, you give them opportunity, they can be an, an opportunity to other, like others, like people who are not refugees. So this was my vision to see, to, to prove them wrong, but also create the opportunity because I was, I believe that once I create one opportunity for one person, it, at least there are 20 people attached to, one, to that one person. So I, I'm actually a little curious how, you know, you're a world traveler, you're, you are really a global citizen, certainly, but how did you end up te originally teaching coding to refugees in the Zatari camp in Jordan? So I will, as I was saying, as I was saying, so uh, uh, um, what happened is that I told you the story about the, the kids who are always the first, okay? And uh, who didn't get the chance to continue, who dropped out? 
And in Rwanda, the, the school, till 15, is free. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I said, let me equip these young people so that even if they drop out, they have something. Even if you drop out, you go to sell tomatoes. To, to, to sell tomatoes. You can develop your Android app and sell tomatoes. And uh, so, uh, and I started teaching kids how to call. And I was working with SAP, a company called SAP, or SAP. And then uh, they are the ones, they came to Rwanda, we started teaching the program, the same program. And then after, they said, you know, can we have a, a, a refugee call? Refugee coding week, coding refugees. So they invited me to Zatare camp. This is how I get connected with them. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. So back to Rwanda. So Jacques has listened to the voice of the customer. They have this trip. They decide they want to do an internet hub. You come in with which you've said twice is your kind of hidden agenda, but also really wanting to prove people wrong, really wanting to do something else. What came next? How did you guys build it, design it, think through it? And what was that original vision that you all had for the coding school? Aphrodis, do you want to start? Yeah. <clears throat> the thing was, the thing is simple, very simple. Jacques, are you there? Do you want to? jump in for us I'm having a little trouble hearing you as well Jacques yeah Jacques I think we were having a little bit of trouble I think as folks saw in the um, chat function that there was a there's a heavy rain in, in Rwanda right now so yeah, can you hear me yeah perfectly thank you okay right good yeah, it's, it's raining like crazy. You know, I had to put my headset so that I can hear your questions. Um, so basically, you're right. And, and it's amazing how these building blocks came together. Um, you remember, I remember when after launching the internet hub in Yabiheke, Afrodis called me and said, hey, listen, we're going to organize Uganda. Uganda and Rwanda, every last Saturday of the month, the whole country, they have, we have what we call community work, <clears throat> where everybody goes into his neighborhood um, and do some work to clean up around, talk to each other about any social issues that uh, have rise in the community. So Alfred said, we're going to invite along our, uh, our companies, MTN. So we did that to Uganda up in the north in, Kizi, in, in Gihembe refugee camp. And then we didn't know, actually, MTN brought about 15 computers and had a package of one year subscription of internet paid for free for all for the, the school. And then we said, hey, now we have two schools. So from that very point, we knew that we need to create just a curriculum to teach these kids in both Yabiheke and Gihembe refugee camps. So it's kind of random how it came together, but falling in the ears of people who we had vision about what to do with this and how to empower these young fellow friends of ours, the refugees in those two camps. It was then easy for us to move forward. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Aphrodis? Yeah, I, I think Jack, Jack uh, has, has talked about, about it. So uh, the vision was to see if we can help these people to, to, to be employable, to be seen in other, other angles, like other aspects. So, and this is what we did. And we said, if you, like there is a saying say, that says, if you want to go far, uh, fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go with others. So this is the how we brought in the MTN and uh, they gave us this. And I'm sure uh, once COVID is over, we do more than what we thought. I think now we have, uh, we ha I think I have, when we started uh, this uh, COVID, uh, well, before this COVID, when we started this uh, school of coding, we had a vision. But I think after this, this like period, I think we have now a bigger vision than that. And which is interesting and more impactful. So I really want to get into that. I, I'm curious, I have a little bit of a, maybe a technical question, if you will. Can you 
Everybody's, can you describe to us, you know, what does the coding school need? What's the curriculum? What's the process for the students? Can you kind of walk us through what six months of the coding school looks like? Yes. Uh, so, so the thing is, the, the, the coding school is 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 like a, a, a intensive intensive course. You say intensive course? I don't know. Like intensive course where we take someone for a short period. And we give them the, all the necessaries, all the skills that can help to, to, to be able to be employable. So what we did is to, to put in place the, 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 the computer labs, the internet, and, uh, and uh, the curriculum. Then we started teaching them, introducing them to, 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 to programming because the, like, the programming is one of the, of the, the, the sectors in IT sector, or the, the, the aspect of the IT sector, which are that are growing so fast and are playing many, many things, many roles. And I said, let me let us equip these young people with different programming skills. We said we are going to teach them HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Java, Python, and PHP. And there are many. But we said let let, let us keep them intro to that. Then, uh, after we have them specializing, why did we choose these languages? It's because they are the ones, uh, they are the ones are uh, like are needed in the market in our region for the moment. We want to, we want to tackle in the opportunity available because many people are looking for JavaScript developers, and they are sure we have JavaScript developers. If you need PHP, we know that we introduced our guy to PHP so that you know we can be able to plug in. Then we said, we are going to teach them all the languages. Then we help them to, 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 to specialize. Not only that, then after we place them for a job, for, for an internship. That, you know, to be familiar with working, working environment. Because sometimes they've been in refugee camp. A refugee camp is where, you know, they are always, you know, when you are always with some people like, same mind, same thing, you know, routine every day. So, but once you step out, you go in a startup world where they don't care, they want everything done, and you have to learn if you are not sure that you don't know a program, and you are hacked, you, are, you have to, to, to sit down in one hour to learn what, what others have learned for two years, and you, you have to learn it in one hour. So, to, to be familiar with working uh, environment. So that's the thing we, are, we, we, we have, that's what we plan. That's, yeah. I apologize, it's raining heavily here. Yeah, I, I mean, if I may add something, uh, but also when, when Aphrodis is speaking, I can hear the really uh, Rwandan mind, you know, you, 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 we are taught not to be shy to try anything new. And this is kind of mindset when you have touched the bottom, you have anywhere else to go other than going up. So then you need just to challenge yourself enough to do it. So um, even myself, when this was selling the idea to my, me, I wasn't really convinced because I said, hey, if you, may you start with me as your guinea pig to confirm if you can teach someone from ground zero to A plus quarter. But when I saw these kids, for example, I will give you an example. Uh, among the kids we had in Gihembe, there's this one guy, uh, the father is a carpenter. They do handcraft made from wood. And then the guy said, okay, great. After learning the, the, the web design part of the, of the program, he started designing a small e-commerce website, put the father's number and his number there so that you can call them and look into their catalog and say, okay, I need this chair. Can you make it? So you see, you are basically they are seeing beyond being taught and start creating solution from their own. And this was really amazing. Uh, another guy from the community now, not the refugee, because in the coding school, we, bring, we brought together a kid from the community and refugee, refugees together in one class. So this guy was planning to have um, an interactive uh, web page where the community can seek information by linking it to their WhatsApp. So um, it was amazing. So I was getting excited. Then I asked the coordinator we had who was coordinating the activity for us. I say, hey, can you design a good capstone project so that by the time they finish the program after seven months, 
ready to be in internships in different company, they have also the solution they created for their own problems in their own community. So that was the vision we had and that's where we were heading. And it was very exciting. Over to you, Joe. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point, right? Because so there is there are conversations, right, if you look between making sure that there's harmony between host communities and refugee camps, obviously in countries all around the world is really important to do. And actually something, there was a comment in the chat by uh, Teresa Devick, and she actually made the point that in her visits to Rwanda is that she's always been struck how kind, caring, and supportive, you know, Rwanda, the citizens of Rwanda and Rwandans are to refugees. And I'm curious, is that, was the, was it, was it deliberate that you all wanted to design the, ref the coding school in a way that was accessible to both um, re residents of the refugee camp and uh, for the host community? Jacques? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Jeremy, uh, for that question. That's very interesting. Um, people, what we may not know is that in the new uh, design of ideas and projects to bring, to help refugees, the refugee used to be seen as an entity within a community that all NGOs and, inter and, and interve people inter interventions focuses on. But now with the new uh, comprehensive uh, response to, refi to refugee um, crisis, we see a refugee within his community. You cannot dissociate the two. One way or another, they will impact each other in different ways, positive and negative ways. So I I've been exposed to the, the creation of a new refugee camp. I built one myself with a team, with my team at Alight, when we had a conflict from Burundi. And I've seen uh, with my eyes of environmentalists how it destroyed the environment, how the community were fighting for the little resources that was, uh, was in place. Think about 60 people landing in a village of about 2,000 people, 60,000 people. So the interaction cannot only be a crash. But the way the government put it up there, say, if you do any intervention, bring all of them together. This will help us to solve conflict. They'll see each other at one community and all the agenda you guys want to bring will be moved towards smooth. So by bringing together these young coders, future coders from the community to come actually and study in the camp, you remove that barrier that is there that nobody can enter the camp because now they are playing together and in the future, they will create the companies together. So that's a plus for this kind of intervention. And the light is keen to work with the government in creating those opportunities. Basically, anything you do, think the community, think the refugee in the community, not the refugee alone without the community. Over to you, Jim. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, and we want to get to a few more questions that have actually popped up in the chat, if you guys um, you know, one of the, Nadia actually threw out the question, which is a really great one as well, is, you know, can you all share um, a few of the impact solutions, community impact solutions that students have come up with and what they're working on in terms of how they're rolling out their new skills? You know, what's been the impact and how they've been able to, um, following their, their graduation, if you will, from, uh, from the coding school? Um, Aphrodis, do you want to take a stab at that one first? Yes, I think, I think <laughs> the first impact above all is the fact that we have connected them with the machine. This is like a life-changing thingy. So, and uh, Jacques shared the one who developed an e-commerce platform. You know, those are some of the impact, but the main impact I think like Allied uh, and all the partners has done is to make sure to tell the, the to, to give opportunity to the refugees to have access on the computer. That it's like, you can't, uh, you can't understand what it means when someone has never touched the computer and he sees it or she sees it and she, used, she uses it to, 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 to build just a line, like a scrolling line on the computer. It's something you are changing the lives that it's the first impact we have made and then, uh, for me it's really something i remember let me let me give you a story it's somehow a joke but it's not a, it's it's a sad story but it's also a joke i remember when i went uh, to 
not it was not in America, it was not even not in Gehem, it was in another camp in town, Chijeme. Chijeme. We uh, we decided to go and teach because we had the you know they were like a high pregnant a teenagers pregnancy, uh, high teenager pregnancy. You know, we said let's go there and start equipping the young girls with technical skills so that they know how to code. You know, it was really informal and a short thing, a, a short, a short uh, period. Then <clears throat> I remember uh, at the first day we went to teach the people. The, those uh, teenager girls, and um, you know, one of girl, uh, uh, some of the girls, they were saying they were like, we asked them write your name. They say, you know, my name is Aphrodis, and they say A is here, P A is a, a P is here, H is here, and like after like four minutes, he, she raises the hand. They, she says, you know, they forgot R, you know, because she can't, she it's the first time even to see the computer. You know, but after two months, when, once you go there and she can type, she can, you know, show you the, just a front page of a website. You see the change. The life ha has changed completely. Jacques, um, I mean, if you can also jump on in this and kind of talk about some of the specific things that you've seen some of the students build out like online appointment scheduling system for the healthcare clinic, uh, things like that. Some of the, can you talk about, uh, can you give us a specific example of some of those kind of community impact solutions that the students have built out? Yeah, yeah. Um, basic, basic, uh, uh, my mic is on, okay. Yep. Yeah, you're yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, basically before, basically as we're getting closer to January, that's when we started working on the capstones and we start seeing actually how diverse with solution popping out of their mind as the one focuses on. And basically we had to merge some of the ideas so that they can also learn how to work together, how to work remotely with the teachers. And as Alfred did say, there are many parameters you can use to see that change. Uh, not only actually a solution that they, they, they will eventually put out there that will help. Um, earlier, I mentioned the two solutions that students were actually bringing forward because those are the two that were almost at the final level. Uh, they were trying now to put them online. So, but others were at the different stages of creating different solutions. There is a guy actually who wanted to create a page that he can sell to UNHCR so that UNHCR can be using it to spread different news, different announcements across the camp. and. You can also communicate with, have an application that you can install on your phone. So with now refugees being taught to have smartphones, to have very affordable smartphones, they can then access his solution. So um, we, we were really looking forward to see how this is gonna come to, to, to the end. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was cut short by the COVID up in March when we were almost doing the two last programs. I think we're gonna get to that and what we think about it. Um, um, if you may, but uh, once we have this solution like uploaded online, this is really something now we'll call the world and say, hey, from ground zero, this is what we come up with. And these are the kids actually changing their own lives uh, and, and connecting to the world. So Jacques, you know, you obviously just mentioned, you know, the impact of COVID um, on the work and, and it's, it's a, Teresa Devick actually had a really good question. Going to that in terms of, you know, are refugees, you know, locked in the camps? Um, and have, they, is, have the coding schools actually continued during this time? Are they able to do the work on their own? Do they need more schooling? Can you give us a little bit of insight in terms of how the coding schools have been running during this during this time? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, what am I going to say? Actually, since March 20th, everything Stopped. Not only bars, but also schools. Um, I remember we were locked in our houses between March 20th all the way to the end of June. Nobody was allowed to go out other than going to the pharmacy or the market. And that, so was, now, the same for the, and that was the same for the residents? Ex everybody. So yeah. me, I was in Kigali, and I can tell you right now, it has been almost impossible to access any refugee camp because of COVID. Basically, we the humanitarians, we had to take some precautions and work remotely so that we don't bring even the COVID from the host community inside of the camp where the li life is already difficult. So most of the interactions move basically on online platforms. So we as a coding school, 
um, managers and, 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 and the scholars, we were hit really so bad because one, we had desktops. So that means our kids need to get into a classroom uh, to, to learn, so to access them. Even if we decided to have our teachers teaching remotely from Kigali, they could not gather in a school because it was not allowed to have people together in a school. Until now, actually, school are now actually resuming in Rwanda. We just, they decided to roll out um, actually education from higher education going down as they measure what's the impact of opening up a school to the whole country. And the camp were not left behind by those measures. So basically, we're not able to do further studies. And the problem is that we were actually this close to the end because we had only to introduce two uh, code languages. We had Python and, uh, and Java to be introduced, take some exercise, and then get ready for the internships um, for those who were capable really to enroll into internships and also to start presenting their capstones and working on them as they do the internships. All that stopped like still. Now we are now rethinking how to reconnect again and bring these kids to finalize the first project, the first um, court, and set them out there in the community within IPC measures that we have to follow because of the COVID. Over to you. Sure. That, that's great that you guys are rethinking, you know, you know, what's the design challenge behind this and how to solve it. I think that that's amazing. So we're a little over the time, um, but so I'm just gonna we're going to quickly answer the last question and actually that that came in and it actually goes back to something that Aphrodis you said earlier um, in the conversation that you know what's the vision for the future um, are eager for what comes next um, for for this coding schools and the students so kind of you, you'll get the you both get the last question we'll start with you Aphrodis but we'll um, then we'll wrap up what's the vision Aphrodis can hear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat? Yeah. You can hear me? The the, yeah, of course. The last question that came in actually is something that you mentioned earlier. And it's about the vision for the future, right? What is what do the coding schools look like to you um, in the future? You mentioned it earlier and somebody wanted to hear the answer. Yes. Um, <laughs> How do I see this, the, 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 not only the, the, the school of coding, like it's beyond the school of coding, it's how do we define the future of refugee? If someone is having an issue here, how do we like plan his way so that wherever he is, his potential is used, that one, Second, how technology we contribute to that. So this is the vision I ha we have now to see how with the light, and uh, even if I left Kela, and uh, with the light we can continue to to build this this like way this path where even if you know many people they, they are displaced because of many reasons. Some of them are because of the poverty, others because of war, others because of main reasons. So what we are going to, to, to think about is how can we use technology to make sure we, we, we prepare the past of refugees, refugees, displaced people, even in their own countries. So that's the vision we have now. And impact more and say, now there is no, no like this is not for, refi for, for, for local people and refugees, they have to be on donor side, no. Let's be something where the, the refugees, anyone can plug in whenever and wherever. Wow, that's an amazing vision. I mean, it's, it's so it's so incredible to see how you're thinking through just completely redefining what a refugee is and how in their impact in the world and seeing how coding schools and technology can support that. That's amazing. Uh, Jacques, do you wanna yep. get any more into that? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, my vision is, I remember when I was interacting with these kids uh, to get going, I told them, guys, given that you guys started from zero, um, if one or two, one girl and one boy graduate and their lives are completely touched and changed in a positive way for good, I would have succeeded. But my, my, my dream is that you all become something 
and we meet somewhere in the world and you 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 are well off because we started this one day so that was my that's my dream but let me say a few things is that right now what i want like today where i sit here is to get some funds and finalize this cohort that we started because we have set expectations so high as we are talking i don't know it's, it's like a mind connection i got an sms from one of them he's saying i am working in a harder situation because it's all because i need a coding a, a cod, coding to change my life and with your help i believe my dream will come true actually i don't have a pc but there is at my secondary school they have one and somebody is willing to 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 let me use it when they are not using it i kept working on my project but it's not simple and i promise i'll become a student you wanted all of us to be so this is a wonderful message when i get this even if i don't have funds now i'm sure with that message it's enough fuel for me to keep going and searching and searching so we need really to get some funds to finalize this course send them in the community to work and start getting something and then expand that initiative to a bigger range of people actually what people don't know is that nobody has tried a coding school as an alternative skills in a refugee camp um i know unhcr tried it in kakuma somewhere in kenya it didn't work but in rwanda alight is the first organization to give this a shot and say actually this can be an alternative skill to those who did not get a chance to go to the university because the unhcr the united nation package of education does not include high uh, uh, higher education i mean university and degrees unless you get one or two scholarships otherwise it's not compulsory so this comes in as something alternative that can empower them to become and reach up to their dreams in the future so uh, we need everybody of for this said not only the government alight as an organization we need also many people to intervene so that uh, the dreams of the kids become true and eventually our dreams also become true thank you very much jerry that's amazing and jacques and everdis you both are so inspiring and it, there's you know it's obviously this was all but there's almost no question as to why it succeeded after having listened to you two uh for the for the last um hour plus this was amazing i certainly could talk to you guys for the next week on end um but it, we're actually a little bit over the time and this actually is going to conclude this work share and it actually concludes our a life first ever virtual work share series but uh stay tuned um because we're going to have another work share series um in the winter of 2021 and because we are this organization who loves to get feedback as well we want to hear from anyone and everyone um about what did you think and is there something that you want to hear about um in our next series is there a country program is there a project is there something that you're just really interested in hearing about and if there is please let us know you'll see up there um alissa j at we are alight.org um you can email her any of your questions any of your comments any of your suggestions um and if not you can also go to our website there's uh links and information on there as well to our work share series so we certainly want to thank both of you for your time today and for your work and for sharing this um with us and for everyone else involved um in the work share series and while we're going to be hitting the pause button on the work share series until the winter of 2021 we look forward to seeing you in the new year thank you all thank you very much huh, for having us Thank you Jeremy and for hosting us uh, it was amazing and bye bye everybody thank you everybody thank you guys amazing thank you. presentation thank you very thank nice you. job thank you thank you thank you goodbye bye bye thanks everyone thank you bye 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 sabine oh, cool